The camera is a very strange instrument. It demands, first of all, that you see coherently. It makes it possible for you to enter into worlds and places and associations that would otherwise be very difficult to do. I think a photographer is a wonderful thing, really. I'm not tied to any place. I can go and come as I like. It's wonderful. My childhood years in Johannesburg were very happy. We enjoyed an enormous amount of freedom. We would ride our bicycles all over the Ranfantine Estates, which was the gold mine around the town and we could explore the mines to a great degree. It's a brutal landscape. It's very bare, bleak. We don't have a sea, we don't have a big river. We just had these rather dull and uninteresting spaces. I think there was a kind of osmosis taking place in me. I became organically related to the place. On the one hand, I want to photograph the land. Land, in a very broad sense. On the other hand, I'm fascinated by our structures as declarations of value. I'm too late for this photograph. The trees are already in leaf, but I'm gonna try and let's have a look. It seems to me that the style of architecture that is emerging to the north of Johannesburg is a kind of aggressive materialism. Morning, gentlemen. How are you? In this country, because of the nakedness almost of the struggles that took place between black and white, the structures that emerged were amazingly clear demonstrations of value systems. White Afrikaner Protestant churches are those that I think of particularly. Their churches had these huge windows and this megaphonic structure. Come the 1970s, the forces of liberation are coming down to South Africa, increasingly impinging on Afrikaners. So the new churches become defensive. There are very few of them built with piercings in the outer walls. Public structures become clear manifestations to self-image. Look at this, look at this. Huge building. But at least this has got a certain amount of movement. That's a Hasselblad. Famous, very expensive, beautifully built box. My brother Dan would come back from somewhere in the world and bring little miniature cameras. He brought back from one of his voyages a Contax camera. The Contax was the Zeiss equivalent of the Leica. It was a great camera. But this particular one had been severely damaged I don't know what its history was during the war, but when it eventually reached Ranfantine, it was a very sick camera. But I tried to do some photography with it. When I matriculated in 48, I certainly had a strong wish to become a magazine photographer. Life and look from America, picture post from England, were the window on the world for millions. In 1952, I think it was, the apartheid government had begun to put its ideology in place. And one of the first steps was to separate the races in public amenities. I did a short strip of film 
of a black man going up and then being turned back by a black policeman. He had been accustomed to taking that route into the Johannesburg railway station and suddenly he was not allowed to. So I sent a strip of those photographs to picture post to the editor. I was politely rejected. I tried to do a magazine story about the men who worked on top of the mine dumps around our town. These men worked right through the year, every day and night, no matter what the conditions, dealing with the waste of the milling operation. We were subjecting these men to a terrible existence. It was freezing cold on the top of those dumps in winter. Here's an old dump. It's been covered in grass to keep down the dust. Black miners could not rise beyond the level of what were known as boss boys or team leaders. Of course, they were not boys, they were men. In order to rise above that level, you had to have a blasting certificate. And this was a method that was used by the white trade unions to ensure that only whites could go into the upper echelons of the mining hierarchy. If one wanted to look at this society, you had to grasp the nature of white Afrikaner life and ideology. The Afrikaners were descended from the Dutch and French, Hugo and German and Scotch, early, early settlers in this country. Small as that group was, they determined a great deal of what happened here. For them, their conquest of the tribes that they encountered were guided by God, the ineffable. This became something that I had to deal with as I saw it in a way that hadn't been done before. During the 1930s, the right-wing Afrikaner movement known as the Osava Brandwach, it was anti-Jewish. Like many of my fellow Jewish friends, I had a fear of Afrikaners from my childhood and yet felt the need to explore this. These people really absorbed me. They frightened me in the depth of the fear of black people and yet at the same time their ease with them. I would be photographing an elderly couple on one of these plots and a little black girl would walk into the parlour sucking her thumb and just stand there watching me work. And they would not say a word to her. They didn't object and tell her to get out. It was just accepted that she would come in and do that. A common response from potential publishers was, where's the apartheid? To me, it was embedded deep, deep, deep in the grain of those photographs. People overseas simply didn't grasp these extraordinary contradictions in our life. I was not interested in trying to explain things to them. We're heading into the center of Boxburg. I photographed here in the winter of 79 and again in 80. Instead of traveling the country and photographing whites generally, I wanted to concentrate on this one community and regard it as a microcosm of white middle-class life in South Africa, and that's what I did. This entire town was reserved for whites. Black people came here only if they had the right paper, a pass. I began to look at these crowds waiting at traffic lights to cross the road and found them remarkably exposing of us. Corner Commissioner and Elof. Oh, we must go up one block. This picture here was taken from where I'm standing now of that shop there. And I was probably standing here when I took this picture. 
I was excited by this winter light that we have. It's very sharp and low angled. These low buildings were to me the quintessence of the world that I knew and grew up in. There's nothing distinctive about them. I don't think there is a single picture in that whole collection in which the subject is looking at the camera or me. I wanted to disappear from the equation. Morning. In Soweto and at Hillbrow, the photographs were encounters between myself and the subject. Instead of trying to photograph life as an ongoing process, I elected to photograph people as they were, in a formal way. I was always insistent that the subject would look at me, not at the camera. In doing those portraits, I became aware of people's bodies in a very emphatic way. Arms, limbs, breasts, hips, necks, particulars. Here is a whole drawer of four by fives. On my death, my negatives, my contact prints, and my working prints would have gone to the University of Cape Town where they had established an archival facility for this purpose. But after the burning of paintings and the burning of some photographs by the students in the university art collection, the university appointed a committee of academics and students to examine every piece of art with a view to deciding whether to pulling out or covering up any artwork that they regarded as potentially offensive to black students. Well, I can't accept that kind of um, evaluation and, and interference in the freedom of expression. And if there are pieces of work in the art collection that perhaps make other people uncomfortable, then let's exhibit them, hold debates. I regard my work as one thing that I will not allow to be compromised. I compromise every day just by drawing breath in this country. But today, under a democracy, I refuse to be complicit. I cancelled my contract and my stuff won't go to the University of Cape Town. I don't think I've ever been bored with photography. I've sometimes become extremely frustrated. Ah, uh, Disgusted. Look at this, look at this. But it's a life-absorbing process. It absorbs me fully. I've changed my mind about photographs 25, 30 years after I've taken them. My problem is that I don't have 25 or 30 years to make up my mind now. I've got to make up my mind much sooner. I was doing photographs of the gold mines and I saw a reflection of myself. So I just snapped it. To learn more about Art 21 and our educational resources, please visit us online at pbs.org slash art21.